Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> Three quick announcements for you. You'll get a notice real soon about this Swift MD thing. And uh, we're providing, a, it's a telehealth thing. Uh, it's at no cost to you. Uh, it actually comes through tax dollars and uh, stuff the government's putting together for us with that. So there's no cost in this for you. And we thought with all the COVID things going on that it would be a good thing to provide you with, you know, 24-7, you can call and get through to a doctor uh, anytime you want to, just so you would not be worrying uh, about what your health is. Uh, but it's not just for COVID. I mean, anything you've got, you can call these people up. You'll get a real doctor uh, and you'll be able to, 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 to uh, talk with them. More information will be coming into your box on that along with a, an access card. Some of you guys may not know that around our pond, uh, we have a creation walk. Several years ago, uh, an artist from Michigan donated to us uh, beautiful bass relief panels of the seven days of creation. We've lost one to vandalism along the way. But, you know, when you walk around there and think about the fact that you are created by someone who loved you and had plans for you, uh, it can make the rest of life go a whole lot better. So you're welcome to do that sometime if you want to and uh, just have to fill in the blanks on the missing panel as you're working through there. One of the things that, about universities that is sometimes uh, new to new students is that uh, we are run by a board of trustees. Uh, they're a governing board of our school. And their role is to provide the most basic guidance for our school. And then they hire a president and an administration. And we carry that all through into policies and how we're going to do the, what they want done. And one of the goals that they've established for me this year to lead the school through uh, pertains to something we've been working on for a while and need to get more formal on. And, you know, we've had such a, such a, a sad summer. A sad isn't the best adjective. Uh, it's been such a, a horrible summer with uh, what's happened in our country and the responses to the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. And we want to do the best we can as a school to actively value people as image bearers. So the trustees have told me that one of the goals they want me to pull off this year is the implementation of a biblically-based diversity program for current faculty, staff, students, and alumni. Now, you'll be hearing more about this as the year goes on. But we've engaged the services of David Robinson. David's a 2004 graduate of the school. He played basketball here, met his wife here, two gorgeous little daughters. Uh, and David is not only the, the varsity basketball coach, but also the director of equity and inclusion down at the Grace Community School in Tyler, Texas. And a great guy. Um, I met him when we just come back from South Africa and uh, he brought a girls team here for a summer camp, came up to see my assistant. And she introduced us and, and uh, gave me one of his CDs, uh, David Raps, and, and he, he does it really well, really solid theology. And it was good stuff, so yeah, I appreciated him. And then when we inducted Coach Shaw into our Hall of Honor here, David came back and we got talking. And so over the last months, we've been working back and forth on this. And you'll, you'll hear more uh, about this as it goes on. But man, from, from the bottom of my heart, I want us to be the kind of people who care realistically about others. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing with you guys today. Um, we live in such a, such a divided world. And sometimes I find that we just talk right past each other, right? You know, I got something to say, you got something to say, neither one of us listens to the other. You know, and we, 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 just, we just talk right past each other. And you've seen it, uh, you've seen it on TV, you've seen it on social media, and uh, maybe you've seen it in your home, or in your church, or where you work, or your dorm. Uh, we're, we're all so sure that we're right. And that's not a bad thing. We're all so sure that we're right. And sometimes we fall victim to using other people as a means for us to prove that. Now, Jesus didn't do that. And our goal here, you know, we talk about being Christ-centered and career-ready. And we want you to be more like Jesus. And sometimes we're right with the truth, but we're wrong about the way we handle it. Some years ago, I read in the Bible a question that Jesus asked that just hit me between the eyes. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do 
what I tell you. I mean, it wouldn't make sense. If he is the Lord, the master, the one who's in charge of us, and he tells us to do something, why would we call him Lord and then ignore him? Now, think about this for a second, though. There's a shorter way to communicate the message here. Get, get rid of the sentence in your mind and just and shorten it down to what, what the heart of it is. I'm God, obey me. Right? That's really what it means. I'm God, obey me. That's what he's saying. But you've got to ask yourself, why would someone who already knows everything bother to ask questions? Uh, one writer that I read this summer as I was developing this stuff in my mind, one writer said that Jesus asked 307 questions in the Gospels. Now, I, I didn't go count them up, okay? But this writer said he asked 307 questions in, in the Gospels, and he asked them of people like us, and he already knew what the answers to the questions were. Why would someone who knows everything ask questions? It wasn't for his own benefit. It was for the benefit of the person that he was asking the questions of. So for today, I want to suggest a question that we ought to be using. It affects our relationship with God and with others. We'll deal with God parts some later time. But here's the question. What do you mean by that? I mean, when someone says something uproariously stupid that even a small child with a limited education, you know, and a low vocabulary, they go, ah, everyone knows that's wrong. Okay. Maybe that's a fact. But that's not our entire goal in life. We're going to be Christ-like. What, what do you mean by that? See, I don't want to misunderstand you. And, and I don't want to assign my meaning to your words. Because yeah, that's part of communication. You say something, it goes into my brain, and I put in whatever's in my brain for what you must have meant. And maybe I'm wrong. And I don't want you to misunderstand yourself either. Because sometimes we just give stock answers to things. It's whatever's in our brain, whatever we heard, and, and we never really thought it through. And we say it. What, what do you mean by that? It's not just a good idea. It's biblical. When I ask you that question, it means that I respect you enough to reason with you, not just to write you off as an idiot, but I respect you enough to reason with you, and that's biblical. From the Apostle Paul on Acts chapter 17, Luke was telling us about his ministry, and he says, and Paul went in, as was his custom, the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them. We get our word logic from the Greek word behind the word reason there. He reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded. Persuade means I used to believe that, and now I believe this. Okay? He was not torturing them into compliance. He was persuading them. Some of them were persuaded. And they joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. I had a member of our church back in my pastoring days who I respected a lot for a variety of reasons. And, and one day in a conversation, he, he mentioned that he just couldn't accept the idea of creationism in the Bible. And we're dealing with a highly educated man, okay? And a godly man who loved the Lord Jesus. And he's just, he just mentioned that. I, I, just, I just can't accept that. Well, listen, you read the first couple chapters of Genesis, and it's pretty obvious what it says, right? I mean, it says that out of nothing came something, and God did it. And so I ask him, I ask him, well, what, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I, I, think, it's, I think it's mythology, now, mythology is a legitimate type of literature, and it's out there. It's got certain characteristics. I think it's mythology. And so we chatted back and forth for a while. And then I asked him again, well, looking at the first, I said, let's say 10 chapters in Genesis. 
Do you think it's all mythology? Oh, no, no. He said, I believe in the flood. I said, okay. I said, how can you tell where the mythology stops and the stuff that's history begins? And he sat there and said, you know, I've never thought about that, Jim. And if I'd approached that as, can't you read Genesis 1 and 2? Can't you read, in the beginning God created? Can't you see what's there so plainly? What kind of idiot are you? We never would have gotten much farther in the conversation. And I want us to think in terms of, what do you mean by that? The changing of the mind, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Look at the very middle. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mind is an important word in the book of Romans. You chase it down sometime. And the renewing of the mind, the changing of the thinking processes. It changes at the heart of what Christianity requires of us. And the changing of the thinking process is what's supposed to happen. I don't know about you, but when somebody makes me feel like a fool, I am not drawn to adopt their views, right? And, and there are plenty of times when I am a fool, you know, and I deserve what I get, but, but, I, but I'm not drawn to adopt their views. But this whole idea we're talking about, what do you mean by that? Maybe I'll learn something, maybe you'll learn something, but there's probably going to be some growth in Christ in the process. Not only does it mean that I respect you enough to reason with you, which is biblical, but it also means that I respect you enough to persuade you, to persuade you, and that's biblical too. A verse that also hit me in my early years in Christ. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. Not just what, whom. I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced. It's the same word for persuade we saw back in the book of Acts. I am persuaded, I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day, the day of his coming, that which has been entrusted to me. Paul said, I didn't used to believe that. Now I do. I've been persuaded. I haven't been badgered. I haven't been pushed. I haven't been forced into it. I've been changed. The way I think has changed. Stephen Covey wrote a book a number of years ago that was a mega bestseller. It's probably still near the top of the list. It's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He made a lot about how it wasn't the seven habits of highly successful people. It was highly effective people. And uh, when it came out, a bunch of us read it and recommended it. And uh, one of my coworkers, in fact, it was a guy who was our, our dean of men at the time, one of our coworkers went to a conference where Dr. Stephen Covey was speaking. And he happened to f- be in the restroom the same time as Dr. Covey was. And so he you know, worked up his courage a little bit and said, Dr. Huffy, I've, I've really appreciated your book. And I've been amazed at, at how much of it sounds like the Bible. Uh, Stephen Covey said, young man, every one of those principles comes from the Bible. Well, he was right. And Covey said, seek first to understand then to be understood. It's in the Bible. What do you mean by that? Shows that we care enough about each other and we care enough about others' development in Christ that we are not trying to shove our beliefs down somebody's throat. We want them to conform to God, not to us. And I want you to try this instead of pushing back. And see if God can use this to make us into better Christ followers. What, what do you mean by that? Because that's not what I think. What, what, what do you mean by that? And see what happens. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, being present with us and loving us deeply and having greater plans for us than we have for ourselves. We ask that you'd move us and shape us and make us into the kind of people we need to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, guys, head out this way toward Phelps. And OSD is gracious.